Hey Church, so glad you're joining us this Thursday evening between Christmas and New Year's. Before we get into tonight's message, I just want to remind you that we have one gathering this Sunday, January 1st, beginning at 10 a.m., where you can join us in person or online. If you usually go to the 9 a.m., go to the 10 a.m. If you usually go to the 11 a.m., go to the 10 a.m., and we're going to have one big worship gathering. Remember to stay updated on everything happening at the church. It's important to be checking our website at ccoceancity.com, our app, and even sign up for our newsletter. We do as much as we can to promote everything happening and really bundle it in a way that you can easily take action with. And we hope you do just that. Act, engage, seek out more information for yourself. Also, to give our teams a brief break before we jump into everything waiting in the new year and after everything we did for the Christmas Day stream and Christmas Eve gatherings, we decided to pick a message from our archives. But we didn't pick a message by just picking a name out of the hat or casting lots or something. This message is specifically selected and centered around something that our elders want to be especially focused on this coming year. We all know that 2022 was a whirlwind of a year, but amidst the chaos, confusion, heartbreak, and renewal, there was one common thread. Of course, that common thread is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working it all together. But the specific thread I'm talking about is prayer. Prayer brought us together on our knees before our God as we asked him to just lead us in the plans that he's already made and worked out for our church. And that, that attitude brought life, restoration, healing and unity. And that is exactly what the leadership here at the church believe we need more of this year, prayer. So without further ado, let's just quiet our hearts and ask the Lord for help to listen as he speaks through this message by Matthew Mayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening where we can join together in watching this message as, as Matthew Mayer preaches your word. Um, although it's a pre-recorded message, although it's an archived message, and Lord, that you have already spoken through Matthew Mayer um, you know, in years past, God, this is still relevant and true for today. And I just pray that you would help us to still our souls, quiet our minds and hearts, and Stay open to listen to what you have to say through this message. Help us to apply it as we go into the new year, as we head toward New Year's Day, January 1st on Sunday, Lord. Help us to make prayer a foundation that our faith is built on this year, Lord. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy. As we come to the closing chapter of 1 John, let us recall the main lessons thus far. Truth is not relative, but definitive. And love does not define God, but God defines love. So as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to truthfully live out love and lovingly speak out truth. And that is why in chapter five, we will see how the only victory that overcomes this world is our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He who has the Son has life, and this life is not a merit to be earned, but mercy to be received. By this we know him and show him. And good evening, church. Welcome back to our midweek gathering. I'm excited to jump back into the book of 1 John, where we're going to pick up right where we left off last time. We were looking at these unbelievable verses, really, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 17. We're going to start with verse 13 because that's where we left off last time. Let me read it and give some context and we'll jump into the new material. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. John writes, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. John's heart was for the early church and the Christian to know with full assurance that they had eternal life. You see, eternal life is not a matter of guesswork. It's a matter of God's work. And if I believe in the name of Jesus Christ, the work that he did on Calvary for me, when I claim that work, 
I inherit eternal life. Eternal life is not just about quantity. It's also about quality. It's life that we have right now. It's God's life. The life that God has in us. Now, with that context and that frame, I wonder if we have eternal life, shouldn't that life be bursting out of us? Shouldn't the world around us see that we have eternal life? Our human minds cannot comprehend what that even means. But the Holy Spirit within us, who quickens our spirit, which was dead because of sin, this free gift called grace, then empowers me, equips me, enables me, and actually lives through me, moves me. Right, so there's a reason why when we come back together on a Thursday or a Sunday, we jump back into God's word to be recalibrated, to have our spirits, our minds recalibrated. Romans chapter 12, verse two says, renewed, renovated, because my stinking thinking sometimes creeps in and I begin to think with my natural mind all over again. And there's a reason why we have to keep our hearts in the word. It quickens my eternal life so I can know I have it and show I have it. Right, because to know I have it will inevitably translate into showing I have it. Now, when I show that I have his life, I live like he has my life. Right, is there anything different about your life that shows that he has your life? Right, because to know that Christ has my life, owns my life, is to live in light of the purchase price. Right, when you think that you aren't worth anything, you need to wrap your mind around Calvary where Christ appraised your life righteous when he went to that cross and took your unrighteousness. Right, he took your wretchedness. He took your sinfulness. So when you have your head down and you're trying to tell yourself that you're not good for anything, you are completely underestimating the value that God placed on you when he died for you. What was this purchase price? A lot of us say, well, it was, it was free. It was free. We receive it as free, but it cost God his life. God bankrupted heaven to give us Jesus. If that purchase price means anything to us, when we leave church, we should explode out on a world that is so desperately broken and in need of what we say we have. Both in word and deed, it should look like I have this quality of life called eternal life. Don't undervalue, don't underestimate how much it cost God to purchase your life back to himself. You know, when the world and a non-believer might use an argument that says, I just can't believe that a God exists who's supposedly good, but he sends people to hell. Have you ever heard that argument? Maybe that was your narrative before you, you came to know Christ. I just can't believe that there's a God who's good, right? But he's sending people to hell and they're missing what God actually did. In fact, God stood between sinful humanity and hell. When he put himself on that cross, he was actually putting himself in the position where everyone from everywhere would have to make a decision, a determination about who Jesus is. No one will be without excuse about who Jesus is. Now, if you were to come at my wife and my daughter, I would put them behind me and I would say to you over my dead body, you want to get to them? You're going to have to do so over my dead body. In essence, I'm saying to you, I am not willing for you to get to them unless you're going to come through me. It's the same exact thing that God said when he put himself on the cross. He said, you want to step into hell eternity? You're going to have to do so over my dead body. God is not sending anybody to hell. When we make a decision to reject him, by default, when you reject life, you get death. When we reject love, by default, we get hate. 
God is saying, and he's pleading through the ministers of the gospel, through the church and Christian, I love you to death. I'm not willing for any to perish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness. It's like God has not forgotten his promise. He's not willing for any to perish, but that all would come to repentance. Just in case you're wondering what God's heart is for sinful humanity, he's not willing for anyone to perish. His heart is mercy over judgment. So what would await the individual who would actually reject the gift of Christ, what would await that type of consequence? You know, back to the argument, God sending people to hell. No, we make decisions to reject God stepping willfully into hell of eternity. This Hebrews verse is unbelievable. Hebrews 10, 29. Remember what God said over my dead body, in case you think I'm making that up? Of how much more worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Like, what do you think's waiting for the one who trampled the body of Jesus under their foot? They're willing to go that far and say, you know what? That gift, I reject it. I don't believe in it. They're taking their eternal life in their own hands and they're stepping into hell. And I'm saying we're the recipients of heaven through Christ. Does that gift motivate or move anybody else in this room? Does that awaken your soul? A lot of you asked two weeks ago if I was okay because of the way I was preaching. You know, I'm preaching like life's depend upon it. Amen. The moment I come out here and I've lost that tenacity, you then should come up to me and say, is everything all right? Amen. See, what the Lord put on my heart is a burden to see his church and the Christians begin rising and roaring. And when we take the purchase price to our heart, God, you paid that price for me? You counted me worthy? You gave me your righteousness? Like that gift should not get old. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, Jesus, also freely give us all things? In other words, he who did not spare his own son, like he gave us Jesus, which was his beloved, his only begotten, his everything. If he gave us Jesus, don't you think that the Father and the Son and the Spirit would give you what you need? Like, why would they withhold anything else from us, this God we serve, if they already gave us everything? Do you understand? This is what John wants us to understand in verse 14. He says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, this is the freedom of speech. That's what the word confidence means here. Now, this is the freedom of speech that we have with God. Now, this is the intimacy that we have. We can approach the throne room of grace, same word, confidence or boldness, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Now, we come into the throne of grace boldly, right? We have an audience with the one true God, and we can speak freely, Right, when you come into this throne room of grace to a holy God, a heavenly father, you can speak freely to him because of Jesus Christ. Now, notice we have a confidence and an assurance that we can speak openly to our God. We're talking about prayer here. You can openly communicate with God. The prayer line to heaven is open because Jesus paid your bill. But notice confidence here does not mean recklessness. Right? It doesn't mean you can say whatever you want to a holy God and a heavenly father. Some might say, God wants to hear how you feel. That's true. God wants you to even vent to him, release it to him. Instead of venting to people, flesh and blood, 
Sometimes that feels good, but what happens is because it's gone horizontal and not vertical, it just builds back up, doesn't it? Because I didn't really release it to the only one who can handle it and take it from me. So I vent my frustrations to him. But never lose sight of the fact that you're talking to a holy God. He can handle how you feel. Can you handle how he feels, though? Would you wait just a moment to let him respond? Because I'm convinced when you vent and give it all to him, he'll give you himself. He'll fill you up with his peace. You want to know how you've effectively communicated your prayer frustrations to God? Is that you leave, whether your knees or your prayer closet or that prayer moment with peace. That's how you know you've truly released. But a lot of us, we let God have what we feel. We let him have it. Psalmist over and over did that too. Psalm 13, Psalm 42, Psalm 55, Psalm 102, Psalm 142, and the list goes on. But none of these Psalms started out with their frustration without ending it with a praise or a recognition of God's amazing works. Like they start out like, where are you, God? I feel like I'm by myself. Why is this happening to me? Where are you? Are you sleeping? Why are my enemies coming at me? Like, there's real frustrations here. But the psalmist always ends with, but I bring into remembrance your faithfulness. I remember your works of old. Like, every single one of these psalms ends with an exclamation point that I don't have it all figured out. I'm very frustrated. I'm freely communicating this to you, but you got it figured out. And it's that statement alone, your will be done, not mine, that instantly brings this heavenly peace to my soul Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says it's the peace of God which transcends all understanding. You can't understand it. Nothing in this world can understand it. And it begins to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Remember, the peace of God is not a feeling. It's a fortress. It's a guard set to deploy upon your heart and mind the places where we actually have anxiety and worry. Those two places where the peace of God stands on guard. It is not freedom of speech means you can be reckless. It is not so you can be religious. Right, I can talk to God so I get religious, I get rote, I get routine, I get ritualistic. Let me illustrate. Two friends were talking, one said to the other, you think you're so religious, I bet you $10 that you cannot quote the Lord's Prayer. The man said, bet. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. The other friend said, are you serious? Reached into his pocket, took out the $10 and said, I didn't think you could do it. <laughs> to be honest, I just thought that illustration was so cute. But prayers like that and even what many say is the Lord's prayer our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, that's a model prayer. It's okay to quote it verbatim. It's okay to have a religious prayer but I'm saying if it's only coming from your mind and it's not being pushed to heaven from your heart, then I'm convinced you're not having freedom of speech with the Father. See, you make that prayer personal. Father in heaven, amazing be your name. Hallowed, majestic be your name. Your kingdom come in my life, your economy in my world. I'm asking for your will to be done, not mine. Give me today what I need, just today, because I can't handle more than today's substance. Give me your bread. Give me the bread of life, your son, Jesus Christ. Forgive me for what I've done. And then give me the mercy, your mercy, to, to help me forgive those who have messed up against me. Lead me not into temptation, because I will fail. Keep me from the, the devil, his temptations, the evil one on the prowl. Deliver us, Lord, because this is yours. 
This kingdom is yours. The power is yours. The glory is yours. To glory be your name. Amen. Make it yours. Personalize it. See, freedom of speech is not about being reckless. It's not about being religious. It's about his righteousness. Ultimately, we can have an audience with God because of Jesus's righteousness. We can have confidence before him because our confidence is based on him. The only reason I can have a confidence with God the Father is because Jesus Christ wrapped me in his righteousness. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12 says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Listen to the emphasis of this one verse. In whom, Jesus, we have boldness, access, confidence through faith in him. Faith in his faithfulness. Your faith should be in God's faithfulness. That he will never let you down. He will never fail you. He has not forsaken you. So my prayerfulness should be framed by his faithfulness. Every prayer that I launch to heaven should be framed by his faithfulness. That helps me understand what I'm to pray for because at the end of the day, I don't always know what I should pray for. His faithfulness frames my prayerfulness. In Matthew 7, verse 11, in Luke 11, verse 13, Jesus is recorded as saying the same thing. He says, if you, being evil earthly fathers, know how to give your children good gifts, how much more do you think your father in heaven will know how to give you good gifts? In Luke, he says, the Holy Spirit. God knows exactly what we need before we ask him for it. If I know that, does that not take the burden or pressure off of your prayer life when you step into the throne room of grace? Lord, I don't even know what to pray for like I ought, but I bet you this one thing, sometimes just having a heart without words is better than having words without without heart. God is so faithful that you can step into your prayer closet and begin saying the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. I better stop before you start, you think I'm talking in tongues up here. What do you mean the alphabet? I'm being dead serious. Our God is so faithful that even if you don't know what to pray and you just start saying the alphabet, God will put the letters together that make words and he will actually know more about what you need than you can even pray. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now watch this in verse 27. Now he who searches the heart, that's Jesus, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints, that's us, according to the will of God. Jesus is making intercession at the right hand of the Father for you and I. So even when you don't have the words to pray, some of you are going through stuff right now, you can't find the words to pray. And I'm saying to you, just go into the presence of God and know that the Holy Spirit is making intercession, making words out of your letters, and Jesus Christ knows exactly what your life needs. That's what he does. However, a lot of the time, Instead of his faithfulness framing my prayerfulness, my selfishness frames my prayerfulness. My prayer life becomes all about me, what I need. God, give me this. God, I need that. God, show up here. And if you really reduced all your prayers, if they were always, always about you, at the end of the day, you're missing the point of prayer. See, if we're being honest, many of our prayer requests are motivated by greed instead of need. If we're being honest, they would be motivated by a greed, not real need. Often it's my will over his will. I might not say it that way, but if I listen to my own prayers or I write them down, what are you asking God to do? A lot of times it's my desires over what he requires. See, Psalm 37, four could be a prayer verse. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. First, you delight yourself in him. You spend time with him. You have intimacy with him. You have the communication freely with him. And what happens is the desires of his heart are deposited into your heart and they then become so intertwined 
with who you are, they become your desires. You want to do God's desires. You want to do God's will. The person that spends time with God wants to begin to do God's will. But James nailed it when he wrote in chapter 4, verse 3, you ask, you do not receive because you ask amiss. Why do we ask amiss? You ready? That we may spend it on our pleasures. He's like, you want your desires done. You want God to meet those desires so you can spend it to your own glory. Mother came into the bedroom after the little boy was tucked in. He began to pray. In the midst of his prayer, he asked God to make Boulder the capital of Denver, or Colorado, excuse me. The mother tells him, why did you pray for that? You know that Denver is the capital of Colorado? The little boy said, yeah, but that's not what I put on my test earlier. <laughs> you see, that's us. We look to change the prayer map when it's set in stone. And the prayer map is the word of God. And we can't change heaven's landmarks to suit our selfish hearts. Now, I chose the word landmark intentionally because defined, it's an object that enables you to establish your location. Without a landmark, you could be lost. But the moment you see that one rock or that yellow building or that billboard or that water tower, a landmark then tells you where you're at. And I'm saying you need landmarks in your prayer life, such as, I'll give you the three G's, three landmarks that until this point, until you make these your landmarks in prayer, your prayer life's lost. G number one, your prayer needs to be to God's glory. To God's glory. No matter what I'm praying for, the healing of a loved one, the deliverance from somebody from sin, a job opportunity, flourishing of marriage and family, to your glory, God. That means you're giving him access to use the answer for his glory. To his glory is a landmark for the kingdom's gain, that the kingdom would gain ground in your life. These are prayers that God will answer to his glory, that his kingdom would come and that the territory would be gained. And the third G, your growth. Your growth into godliness. That's a landmark. A lot of times we're asked, listen to me, pray to get out of trouble but please know God's priority is to get the trouble out of you. God's priority is to grow your heart. God's priority is to develop your character, not your comfort. So you could be in an affliction. I'm telling you, according to those landmarks, God wants you there because he's going to make, make much of himself through it, glory. He's going to take some ground for the kingdom, and he's going to grow your spirit. If I know those landmarks and I see them in my prayer life, Everything else in between those landmarks, that's freedom of speech. Now this is the confidence, verse 14, that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask anything according to God's will. Now let me say, this is the revealed will of God, the Holy Bible. In case you're asking, what's God's will for my life? This is one of the ways he reveals his will. He has a secret will. But his secret will will never contradict his revealed will. So there are things that he allows or does that I don't have answers for, but I know his revealed will, which means I can trust his heart, which means I'll never question his will. You can trust God's heart, which means you don't have to question his will. First things first, a lot of people seeing this verse go, well, how do we know what God's will is? And that's the wrong question. The question isn't, what is God's will? The question is, are you willing to do God's will? Because it doesn't matter if he reveals to you exactly his will. If you're not willing to do it, then what's the big deal? The first desire of the Christian's heart is to do the Father's will. How do you know that you are a bona fide believer? You want to do God's will. The spirit that gets inside of you wants to begin to do the works of God. If you're questioning whether or not you want to do God's will, you want to do his work, I would have you ask the question, am I even saved? 
Like the spirit yearns within us when you pray into the will of God. It's because you have a desire to do the will of God. God's will is synonymous with his name. When Jesus said, pray in my name, we took these verses, John 14, verses 13 and 14, John 15, 16, John 16, 24 specifically. We've taken these verses when Jesus said, for example, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. We've taken these verses out of context, and we've popped in the name of Jesus or in Jesus' name at the end of every prayer, believing we're praying into God's will as if it's a cosmic Coke machine or a genie in a bottle. As long as I say, in Jesus' name, amen, I believe I've prayed into the Father's will. But the name is synonymous with the will when the name is prayed into by his character. In other words, I'm praying in the character of Jesus. I'm praying as if Jesus would pray it himself. That's how you got to look at your prayer life. The confidence you have, would Jesus say that prayer? See, these verses, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll do it. Another verse, until now you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. These verses have created a doctrine in and of themselves, not only in our prayer life, but also an entire faith doctrine that's known as name it, claim it. You know, as long as you name it, you can claim it, right? In the name of Jesus, as long as I name it, I can claim it because Jesus said, if I ask anything in his name, he'll do it. And it's so far out of context. Prayer is not name it, claim it. Prayer is knowing that if you claim his will, by his name, he will. By his authority, he will. By his character, he will. When you claim his will, you see, if there was ever a time or if, if there was ever a person who could name it and claim it, it would have been Jesus Christ. At a moment where he went to the Father in the garden called Gethsemane. And he prayed a prayer three times according to scripture. And he said, Father, would you remove this cup from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. You see, if there was ever the ability to name it and claim it, to get out of suffering, to be removed from the trial, to be blessed financially, physically, and every other way, it would have been right there in that moment with the Son of God who had the Father's undivided attention. No. He said, nevertheless, that was the true prayer of faith. Nevertheless, not what I want, not what I'm naming and claiming right now because I don't want to drink this cup. Do you understand? Let this cup pass. But not what I want, Jesus said. A.K.A., I want what you want, Jesus said. And guess what the answer from heaven was? No. No. Sometimes the answer from heaven is no. And had the Father answered Jesus' prayer with a yes, there'd be no salvation. We would be, as Paul said, people most pitiful. See, if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, verse 15, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. I love the words here. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have. If we know that he hears, we know that we have. You see, when we pray, God answers. But there's really only three answers to every prayer. It's either a yes, it's either a no, or a lot of times it's a wait. And I often tell people, delays are not denials. Keep praying, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking. But the yes, when it comes... Make sure you give God the glory. Make sure you have the eyes to see it. You see, in Acts chapter 12, 
it, it kicks off by saying King Herod killed the brother of John, James, with a sword. So he's martyred. The early church is in a panic. The next person that was on the chopping block that King Herod wanted to go after to appease the Jews was Peter. In fact, they took Peter into custody and they put him in prison. And it tells us the church was praying for Peter. Now what happens is an angel visits Peter, actually frees him from the jail cell. He goes back to the house where they're all gathered and he knocks on the door and it says a gatekeeper, a girl named Rhoda, she hears the voice of Peter. She's in shock, astonished. She runs back to the group and tells them, you won't believe it. Peter's here. And they say to her, knock it off. Peter can't be here. He's in prison. That's who we're praying for. See, the church didn't even believe their own prayers. God, would you release Peter from prison? Hey, Peter's at the door. Knock it off. We're praying for Peter right now. (laughs) Sometimes it's a yes. Sometimes the miracle will come, and you won't even be able to believe it. And it had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with God's glory. Sometimes it's a no, because you better believe the same amount of prayer was going up to heaven for John the Baptist. He was a great preacher, the forerunner of Jesus. But guess what the will of God was for him? Father, release him from jail. And they cut off his head. That was the will of God. Sometimes it's a wait. I prayed a prayer when I was 13 years of age. It was several months after losing a very good friend, Matt Lasser. He was killed in a car accident. I remember being at the funeral and seeing this young life to our natural minds cut short. But then seeing the people and the response in the community, people that were repenting and coming back to the Lord, people that were complacent and playing church and playing with their faith, being completely broken, and all because a 12-year-old life was taken so short. But as you began to watch the impact, the ripple effect through the months, you began to see that God's hand was all over it. Seeing his family respond, his mother, April, his father, Bob. But I remember seeing that. As a 13-year-old boy, I wanted my life to be used. I remember praying a prayer specifically. In light of losing Matt, I said to the Lord, Father, if it requires you taking my life as well physically, that it would bring people to you, your will be done. I'll never forget praying that prayer. But then life happened. Became a teenager, young adult. I eventually got into my own trouble. 13 plus years later, God brought that exact prayer back to my attention laying in my bunk in jail, and that prayer, literally, it was like God was saying, do you remember that prayer you prayed? Remember you asked me to take your life physically? Well, I said no to that. I'm going to answer your prayer, not in the way you prayed it, but in the way I know you need it. You see, knowing our petition has been heard isn't about getting what we want, but God giving us what he knows we need. You know, what's really remarkable is that I do this for a living now. And I get to do it in honor of my friend Matt Lasser because his death spurred on a prayer that I prayed about God taking my life. And now when I wake up each day, I say, Lord, my life is yours. I understand the purchase price. Spend me as you see fit. See, God answers every prayer. No, wait, or yes. Remember, when he says wait, he's accomplishing two things. He's slowing you down, or he's growing you up, or he's doing both. Wait, you're not ready. I need your maturity to rise to meet the responsibility, and you're not there yet, so I'm going to have you wait. For example, Abraham wanted a child. He said, God, what's the sign that you'll give me? And God said, I'm going to give you a child through your own body, the promised child. But you know when he prayed that prayer in Genesis 15, it wasn't answered until Genesis 21, Do you know there was 25 years that separated the moment God said that to him and the moment that God gave him what he said he would? Do you understand what happened in the midst of that 25 years? Sarah 
She obviously wanting to fulfill that promise as well, gave her handmaiden Hagar to Abraham, which was customary. And he actually impregnated her and had a child with her that they named Ishmael. Did you know history says the Ishmaelites would actually become a great people in the midst of Abraham making a decision to take Hagar and having a child that wasn't God's will. Eventually the people grew so much, they became one of the main enemies of God, the Ishmaelites. Ironically, the Ishmaelites were the ones that bought Joseph and sold him into Egypt. You see now, even God uses the things not in his will essentially for Abraham eventually to bless the people of Israel. Now you wanna see how amazing this gets? We're watching today all of the chaos and the tension in the Middle East, all of the Arab nations that have their animosity directed at the Jews, Israel, they are all descendants of Ishmael. The same exact consequences are in existence today because one man chose not to wait on the Lord. When God said, wait, I'm going to give you a child named Isaac, and through him, I'm going to bless you. He went out and did his own thing. When you don't wait on God because God's not coming in your timeline, you, out, you go out and do your own thing in the flesh, and I'm telling you, there are more consequences when you don't wait on God and you go out and do your own thing. He said, wait, that job's not for you. That relationship's not for you. Wait. And you want to put yourself in and you put your hands where God's hand should be and you produce something of the flesh. Sometimes the answer is no. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul went to the throne room of grace. He pled with the Lord three times, it says. Would you remove this thorn in my flesh? This irritant, this nag, it's bothering me. Would you remove it? This is the apostle Paul who had the ability to heal, yet he's going to God for healing. Do you understand this? And God said, no. In fact, no to removal. That thorn, that's by my approval because my grace is sufficient. I'll give you my grace and I'll turn that little thorn into a throne and my power will rest upon it. That's what made Paul explode in prayer and saying, now I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. I'm going to boast in my affirmities. I'm going to boast in insults. Like he understood that the answer was no. Sometimes the answer is yes. You want to know three prayers that God will always say yes to? Number one, he will say yes to the possession of wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. The possession of wisdom. You want more wisdom? God will answer that prayer. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. You have to know the word of God, the knowledge of God's word. When you say, God, give me more wisdom, he empowers you to work out the knowledge. That's wisdom. More wisdom to make decisions. More wisdoms to know God's will. God will answer that prayer. Possession of wisdom and profession of his name. He will answer the prayer from your heart that says, God, I just want to profess your name. Give me the, the opportunity. Give me the platform. Make my coworkers ask me questions that I have the answer that's going to point to you. Psalm 115.1, not to us, not to us, O Lord, but unto your name, do yourself glory. Psalm 115.1. And finally, number three, God will never say no to this prayer, the confession of sins. Possession of wisdom, profession of his name, and confession of sins. 1 John 1, 9. We know this. We covered this several months ago. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you from your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, this is a perfect place to pivot because we just got done talking about confidence in prayer, right? Verses 14 and 15. Now, insert verse 16. Completely throws you off. I thought we were talking about having confidence with God and whatever we ask of him, he hears us and according to his will, he gives us. And then John's like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You want to get serious in your prayer life? Pray about this. If anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. John's like, hey, you want to pray about something in God's will? Pray about the person in your life who's sinning and you go on your knees in intercession on their behalf. 
But then this next part says, there is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. This verse right here, remember I said a couple weeks ago in reference to John mentioning the water and the blood, very hard verses to translate. What we do is we look at the rest of scriptures. This is good Bible study. You find a verse that's complicated. You don't just isolate the verse and create your own belief or doctrine out of. That's, what, that's the word heresy. That's what heresies are. Heresy actually means opinion. So when you hear the word heresy, they're basically saying it's somebody's opinion. They took one verse, they made their own opinion out of it. You take the word of God, one verse that's complicated, and you look at other verses, other passages, other areas, other accounts, other stories, and as long as it doesn't contradict from Genesis to Revelation, you can hang your faith on that. Water and blood, what do we do with that? We said he was born by water, right? Water and blood, he came through Virgin Mary, that's accurate. We said he was baptized in water, that's accurate. He had water and blood come from his side on the cross. That's accurate. We put all those together and we say, maybe John was talking about the water and the blood of his baptism, his birth and his death. Maybe those are the witnesses of God that prove Jesus is who he said he is. That's good doctrine. That's good Bible study. But when you come to a verse like this and it says there's a sin leading to death, people have erred greatly. I'll give you the four wide views according to this verse. The first view that people believe this verse is talking about. What's the sin leading to death? is that it's some major sin, such as murder, adultery, idolatry. This verse alone is the basis behind the Roman Catholicism doctrine of venial and mortal sins. A person is room, oh, here he goes again against the Catholics. Yeah, here I go against the Catholics. That right there would disqualify Moses for murder, David for murder and adultery, Paul for murder, and many other great men of God. There is no such thing as a venial and mortal sin. All sin equals death. There's only one sin that is not forgiven, and it's when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It's when you reject the forgiveness that Jesus accomplished on the cross. Which leads me to the second view that John is saying the sin that leads to death is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's accurate. Now, whether or not he's talking about that here, we don't know. The key to unlock this phrase is found with the audience. There was something in the midst of this early church where they all knew what he was talking about. See, we're left with interpretation and translation trying to figure it out. I don't believe that he's talking about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit here even though that is true, that's the only one unpardonable sin that God can't forgive is when you don't receive his forgiveness. It's pretty simple. Third view, he's talking about apostasy. Apostasy is when somebody leaves the faith. Now, the problem with that is, remember, John says, if you see a brother sinning, the word brother here isn't general. The word brother here is like if you see a believer sinning and you can't apostatize or you can't leave the faith if you were never truly a genuine believer. If somebody's left the church or has rejected their faith, they were never truly a believer in the first place. People say this verse qualifies you from losing your salvation, but that contradicts when Jesus said, hey, hey, if salvation is something that you keep in your hands, you can lose it. But salvation is something that my father keeps and no one can snatch the people out of my father's hands. You understand what I'm saying? The fourth translation, which is may, probably what John's talking about here, is the sin leading to death could be a reference to sin committed by a Christian, a believer, that actually led to their physical death as a result of God's discipline. They were a believer, but they started making decisions that come with consequences, so much so that that lifestyle choice led to their actual premature physical death. Now, I don't want to spend too much more time there. You have to do your own study in, as long as it doesn't contradict with the rest of Scripture. But I want to spend the majority of our time left looking at the brother sinning. How do you, how do you pray for him? Notice it doesn't say, if you hear your brother is sinning. Yeah. If you hear about it. You know how many times I hear what you hear? And the only way I hear what you hear is because it comes to me by an email or a phone call or at the door, or can I talk to you, Pastor? And you want to tell me what you heard about somebody else. And John's like, no, 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 it's not if you heard. If you see your brother sinning, if you see he's slipping. Notice it doesn't say, if you see your brother sinning, tell the pastor. I'm dead serious. You know how many 
messages Pastor Matt and I get about people saying they saw somebody else sin, and I'm like, really? Well, why don't you do something about it? Because that's what the verse says. If you see it, and it really tweaked your heart, it says, pray for them. Ask God. Intercede for them. Notice it does not say if you see your brother sinning, submit their struggle as a prayer request to the prayer team under the disguise of concern, even though that's called gossip. It ought not be. It ought not be amongst us. Three pastors aren't susceptible or are susceptible to this even, right? They get together and they ask each other, would you pray? And the one pastor said, listen, I got nobody else to turn to, to confess. I struggle with the bottle. I really do. I preach a sermon on a Sunday and I begin drinking as soon as I get home. The other pastor felt comfortable enough to say, I appreciate you being honest. I struggle with lust. Can't stop looking at women. I lust over women. The other pastor, the third, kind of was quiet. I said, what about you? He goes, my struggle is gossip. And if you'll excuse me for a moment, I have to go make a few phone calls. <laughs> terrible. James 5, 16 to 20, need to read it. Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Like, hey, be open and vulnerable with one another. When you have a rapport with somebody, use them as the individual who you can share with, vent with, and then go to God with it, right? Pray together. We're in this together. And then he gives us a case study. Elijah was a man with a nature like yours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced fruit. And then it gets back to the theme. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he, he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Like if we cared that much about each other and we saw somebody that's struggling in sin and we would have a heart of compassion, that's the other side of prayer, confidence and compassion, that we would pray for them. Because the point of all of this is this. Before you speak to that person about their sin, you need to speak to God about that person. Before you speak to somebody else about that person, you need to speak to God. You need to bring that person to God. Prayer is pivotal in the restoration process to save a soul from death. Jesus did it. Remember when he prayed an intercessory prayer for Peter? Peter, Satan's asked for you that he's going to divide you, sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith might not fail. Right? I've prayed that your faith might not fail. Not that you would be kept from the temptation. Not that you would be delivered from even having to make a decision in that temptation. But that your faith would not fail. And then he says, when you come back to me, when you return to me, strengthen your brother. In other words, I'm praying for you. I'm interceding on your behalf so that when you return, there's going to be substance and purpose in even your failure. This is what the Bible calls us to. Galatians 6.1, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore him with a spirit of gentleness. Right? It says, if anyone is overtaken, the word means overtaken, but not taken over. They've just started on the pathway of sin. They're not too far down. You see that. Before they can get too far down in that relationship where the other person's a non-believer and they're pulling them away from the church, they're pulling them away from their convictions, you no longer see them, you're wondering where are they, right before it takes them over, restore them. Confront them, approach them in love like a chiropractor does, right? Can't a chiropractor do some work? Can't they like, you ever had them crack your neck? That's rough, right? And firm, but it's gentle. It's like done so well to spiritually adjust someone. Yeah, it's gonna apply some firm pressure, but it needs to be gentle. Now, the rest of this verse will give us Meaning to verse 17, he says, considering yourself lest you be tempted. Right, before you think you got your, you know, spiritual restoration equipment on and you're going to go restore people, he's like, take heed to yourself lest you fall. 
You know why? Because it's so easy for us to think, look at me. I've come so far. I don't struggle with those sins anymore. Isn't it easy to look down on people? If we're being honest, isn't it easy to look down on people? You hear somebody's hitting the bottle, they're drugging, you're like, how could they do that? And it's like, be careful. What they're struggling with is not what you're struggling with. We're all struggling with something. And that's why John ends with verse 17. He says, all unrighteousness is sin. And there's sin not leading to death. He's like, all of us are still going to sin. We're going to mess up. We're going to transgress against God. To the person that thinks, I'll never do that, he's like, you're doing it right now. (laughs) You're like in the midst of doing it by judging. So if I could wrap everything I've said in the, the second half of this message, remember the first half was having confidence before God, you pray, keep praying, keep asking, ask for the healing, ask for him to bless you, but know that he's going to give an answer. It's either a yes, a no, or a wait. But the second half was about us going to the throne room of grace on behalf of somebody else, interceding on their behalf. All of that to say this, we have no right to point out somebody else's dirty feet unless we're willing to get down and help them wash them clean. We have no right. See, when I know Christ purchased my life, I live in light of that. I can have confidence before him because my confidence is based solely on him. His faithfulness is the frame of reference for my prayerfulness. I have to watch my prayers because sometimes they're motivated by greed and not need. Prayer is not name it, claim it. Prayer is claiming his will because by his name, he will. I know that when I ask him, he's going to answer with a yes, a no, or a wait. I trust that his will is best, that the Father knows what I need even before I ask it. And at the end of the day, if we would be a people and a body of believers that interceded on each other's behalf, that we'd have hearts to care instead of gossiping about other believers, we would be about the gospel and bring it to other people. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless. Man, we hope this message inspires you to make prayer a focus in your life in 2023, um, as well as the next couple days that we have left of 2022. Remember that we have one gathering this Sunday, January 1st, not two. We have one gathering at 10 a.m. So you 9 a.m.ers, go to the 10 a.m. You 11 a.m.ers, go to the 10 a.m. Let's have one big epic worship gathering. We hope to see you there. God bless.